What do you have there, Max? <laughs> My career set and mini cassette. Very good. What I do you have? I have a compact cassette. Compact like you. Wait, so if this is a cassette, then what do I have here? Ah, that's something different. DC International cassette. Hello. Earlier this year, you might have seen Techmoan do a very interesting video on a cassette format called DC International. Well, I have a machine here. This is uh, just as it's arrived. I don't know if it works. It won't work. Let's see if we can fix it. So this is how it arrived from eBay. It wasn't particularly expensive. Let's uh, unwrap it. I've taken a bit of the tape off. Now I think Mr. Techmoan had the last and best model and here I think we have a slightly earlier. Oh. <clears throat> Oops, something's just fallen off. Uh, Legend's just fallen off there. Oh, and one of the little metal plastic bits. So it needs a little glue for the cosmetics. Let's put those pieces somewhere safe. Now I believe there's a cassette in here as well. So here it is, the C100L. The first thing we have to do is power it. Does it have a DC input jack? Made in Germany, it says. How do you open a battery hatch? We don't know, do we? This is a a voyage discovery. Nice carry handle. It's a fairly heavy lump. You'd be quite surprised how heavy that is. Screw is a little rusty, which is slightly worrying. This clearly does something, doesn't it? What sockets do we have? Well, that says, I believe that's microphone and speaker, headphones, two lines. That might be DC, but it's a stranger socket. I mean, there stand, that's a normal five pinned in. That's um, a slightly oddball five pinned in maybe. Well, it might be a normal one, but this, Never seen anything like it. I don't think I'm going to be able to even try it until I've got some idea how to power it. So I may take it apart before we go any further. Oh, how about ejecting the tape? This looks like an eject button, but that's actually record. So this is how you eject the tape. Something to do with this slidey thing here. What, the lid comes off? Then how do you get the tape out? It definitely is record, isn't it, that one? Yes. So how are you supposed to get the cassette out? Fascinatingly strange. So at the moment I have been able to not been able to do the basics that that you should be able to do without thinking about it, which is take the battery cover off and get the cassette out. Is there a button somewhere? Ah, the stop button. <laughs> Of course. Remember, it is Grundig. It's not going to be easy to work, is it? Okay, so we have a cassette we can play with. The heads look to be in very good condition. This not this hasn't had a lot of use at all. Let's take a closer look. The pinch roller, I mean it's had a little bit of use, but 
Not much. That is in tidy condition. I like that a lot. Oh yeah, you can see a hint of the head, the main head having been used. But no, I'd say that that's in pretty good shape. That's not had a lot of use. Okay. What would be an appropriate screwdriver for a piece that's come from the late 60s? Is this correct? That feels right. Ooh, long screws. They're all five long screws. Does it get, get us anywhere? Yes. That's obviously the battery compartment. Why I failed the IQ test on learning how to uh, fit batteries. Another matter. So when you slide this. Ah. I see. When you slide this, then you pull the battery compartment out that way. That's where I was failing. That's all fine. A little bit of tarnishing going on there, but I wouldn't say that it's had loads of leaky batteries in there. Right. Oops. It's so heavy. At some point, we'll find out where all the weight is. But anyway, before I go any further, I can already see that the capstan is missing a drive belt. Well, that's to be expected, isn't it? What do we have to do to take the deck out? Pull the knobs off. That it? Well, that comes apart nicely. Look at the speaker. That's cost some money, hasn't it? Really heavy magnet on that. That's a half decent speaker, that one. Big elliptical. Grundig branded speaker. I'll try not to stress the wires on that. You can see the age of this, can't you? The old fashioned manually laid out circuit boards. I'm looking at that strange socket to see if that is a power input. And I don't believe it is. Oh, hang on. Yeah, it might be, it might be. Because at least one of the term wires goes to the battery terminals at the back here. The black one goes to this wire here. There's a red wire, but it's very, very thin. I can't believe that's main power wire. And a blue one, which seems to come to the top. Maybe that's something to do with the battery meter. All a bit of a mystery. There's a transformer there. That must be the audio output transformer. So yes, it, it does appear to be DC input socket there, but I have to be very careful. Look at these germanium transistors. In sockets, I think. <laughs> wow. This looks fairly much like a normal cassette deck. You would easily mistake that for an ordinary audio cassette deck just looking at that part. I'm impressed with the uh, chassis coming out in one piece. So now we need to find out how to take the circuit board off the deck. It's shedding lots of um, kind of powder. There's a screw there which could be 
something to do with releasing the circuit board. I've just put my finger in some grease on the cassette deck. Right, I can see that the board is slotted in the bottom here. So it's a case of releasing the board, I think it is that screw, and then taking it'll probably come out with a minimum of effort. Bits like that screw feels like that's been off before. So there's a screening cover, and this is foam, and that's what's creating all the black rot. And where the foam has been on the board, it's kind of left a bit of a a mess. Is that another screw to release the board? Very thin slot on it. It's thinner than my screwdriver. Okay, that's a very long screw there. Hope you're taking notes. You can help me put it back together later. Is that another screw hiding under the gunge there? Let's see if we can find a thinner screwdriver for the job. Another long one. Aha. Uh -huh. Still it refuses to move because the sockets well there's a panel here that where the sockets are screwed onto the side panel. Feeling a bit more promising. There we go. So, what drive belts do we have? Or should we have? There are friction surfaces here, which appear to be in fairly good condition. There's capstan, seems to have two capstan wheels. Going to the motor. The motor is mounted that way. So how does it translate that direction? Hmm. Anyhow, there is a drive belt. And it does appear to be in reasonably good condition. Very long drive belt. So it seems that the belt goes from this pulley onto the motor pulley at the back side and then from the top side of the motor pulley over to this. So it must go at a very slight angle. What a peculiar arrangement. Never seen anything quite like it. But mechanically it seems to be in fairly good shape. So. I think it's worth powering it up. I'll reassemble it and power it up. Um, well, first challenge is to work out how to power it. I'll probably work out what the polarity is on the battery hatch and then connect directly to the tabs at the back of this. So let's uh, reassemble that. Did anybody remember how all the uh, screws fitted in? So, having briefly reassembled it, my plan is to feed the power into these two tabs at the back, but I need to get the polarity right. I mean, I really do. I also need to know what the voltage is. 
Well, maybe I can get both answers from here. How many batteries did it take? What kind of batteries did it take? Uh, I think it took D cells, and it looks like it took one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's almost certainly nine volts. Because you wouldn't wire it up any other way, would you? So it goes negative, positive, and then into this one, negative, positive, and then this track takes you there, negative, positive, so that's right. And then this terminal here is the positive terminal. So I just need to think about how that fits in the chassis in the case. That's to the back. Okay, so the positive is here, the negative is there. However, I'm going to check that. I'm just going to get a little bit more evidence that that's correct. I'm sure it is, but you just can't afford to make a mistake. The one I think is negative has a black wire on it. That's always a good sign, but it's still not proof. Because the one I think is positive seems to have a black wire on it too. And you can outtake it as red, that it's a negative chassis piece of equipment, with all these germanium transistors around, that more often than not were PNP, you could have a chassis that was at the supply uh, the high uh, the the positive battery terminal so i need some other clues well there are these capacitors electrolytic capacitors Let's see if the negative terminal on the capacitor is connected to either of these. Yes, it's connected to the negative. And the positive terminal capacitor is not, well, it was pot shot. Depends what part of the circuit it comes from. But that's two capacitors there, both of whom, whom have a negative terminal at or extremely close to what I believe is a negative terminal of the device, of the whole unit. So that gives me reasonable confidence that I've made no mistakes. And that that is negative. Even so, I'm going to be a bit careful with the power supply. So I set it to 9 volts, but I set a very low current limit. Nothing happened. I think that's a good thing. I'm just going to turn this around. I'll switch the power supply off for a second. I'm going to turn it around so I can get to it a little easier. I'll put this on because it's quite hard to know what button does what. Well, it's quite hard to know even when they are marked up on the Grundig, but even harder when they're not marked up. So let's briefly put that back on we'll start with fast forward it's non-latching nothing uh, went straight into overcurrent position okay a bit more current it's trying to take an amp 
Is that right? Too much, surely. I think what we need to do is have a look at how the motor connects because, of course, when you press one of these buttons, you will connect the motor across the supply. So let's have a look at that. First, the first thing I've just found out here is pressing that with the motor running in this particular direction makes the spin the spool turn that way. So that must be the direction the motor spins in. And it'll go the other way with rewind selected, yes. And with start, which is I think that one, it won't engage without a cassette, I think. You have to make it think there's a cassette in there. There we go. And we can see the take up spool and capstan all working. So mechanically, it seems to be working quite nicely. We just need to find out uh, what's going on with this motor. So now the motor should be across the supply. There's a possibility that we have an overload on the circuit board somewhere due to a failed component, in which case it's going to be fairly challenging to fix and I may have to get the diagrams if they're available anywhere. Okay, let's take this ball off again. Looking at the motor here, let's see if we can find out where the uh, motor supply wires are. If I can remove this meter, it might give you slightly better access. There we go. I'm not a lot wiser. Where do the wires run to this meter, this motor? Well, there's an extraordinarily complicated circuit board here, and I think that drives the motor. Oh my heavens. What, some sort of speed control? It's got some power transistors. AC188K, they're big, high power germanium power transistors. And then a whole bunch of wires. Let's see if you can see them. A whole bunch of wires. Off the end of the motor. So I don't know if you can see that, but I'm trying to point there. There's this bucket load of wires all disappearing into the abyss, which is presumably the abyss of the motor. Extraordinarily complicated way to drive a motor. Why would they do it like that? don't change the direction of the motor that's done mechanically oh that is not a transformer to the speaker that is a choke extraordinarily complicated a white wire coming from a PCB at the bottom comes to this terminal then through the choke which is also associated with this capacitor this is extraordinarily complicated what is this myriad of wiring here all about? Can we find the switch to the motor? 
Fucking big switch here. What does that one do? That might be the record play switch, I suspect it is. Yes, that's record play, so it's in play position at the moment over there. So, nothing to do with it. There's a switch here on the bottom of the circuit board, which is activated by something. Let's um, pop it back together again, at least briefly. See now why they designed it this way. The circuit board's position is so important because it's got a switch from the deck operating the uh, big micro switch on the what kind of micro switch on the lower PCB, which isn't you know that different to the way video recorders were made until recently. Let's reconnect the supply. I'll set the current limit low and switch it on. It's current limited out. Right, I set it to 9 volts or just under. It's taking no current. Select fast forward. Oh, the motor's running. It seems a bit happier now. It's taking... Oh. It's taking 150 milliamps and fast forwarding properly. But the motor seems to be running on. Can't believe that's right. The volume is set. Oh, oh, this volume control is a bit crackly. That doesn't seem unreasonable. And there's a the tone control. So we've got the cassette in here. Fast forward just seems to shut the motor off. Though they amplify it off. Start. Shuts the amplifier off. Uh, stop does what you'd expect. And rewind. Shuts the amplifier off. And the motor, for some reason, is no longer spinning. So the switch is back to front and the motor is only working when it feels like it. That's the position we're at. Let's uh, switch the supply off. Which is the play button. Third one along, which says start. Because it wouldn't be labelled play because it's grunding. There's an adjustment here for the actuator on that switch, but something not quite right there. So we need to understand how this switch works. So when you press play, this lever releases this switch. So maybe the way to assemble it is to assemble it while you're in the play mode. The switch contacts are there, so I'll test that in a moment. Actually, I'll test it now. Right, it's made now, okay. And when it's pushed down by not being in play mode, it goes off. Okay, I like that. Good, we understand that bit. These components then, what they're doing is holding the PCB in exactly the right place. They're quite important. So, they should still be made because it's in play mode. Right, hit stop. And they should be open. Correct. Let's see if it uh, makes a little bit more sense now. Switch the power supply on. Nice and quiet. Press the play button. That's correct. That's the right way around now. But what's not happening now is the motor's not spinning. Why is the motor not spinning? Let's manually turn it a few turns. And 
and try again. It might have dead spots on the motor. That seems to be working. That does imply I got dead spots on the motor. Okay, let's uh, pop a tape in and see if we can get it to work. Dead spot moment again. Spin the motor slightly. No, what's happening now is it's just taking huge amounts of current. And the power supply is shutting down. Okay, here we are the following morning. I've done a couple of things. I've done some cosmetics. And I think we might be getting somewhere. Remember I said I've got this problem that sometimes the power supply just shuts down due to an overload. But other times the machine seemed to run. Well, I think I might have got it to run. Let's see. No, power supply is in shutdown mode. But if I tap this button, there is a way of getting it to work. Hey, sir. Aha! There we go. We're rolling. So what's happening is intermittently, when I'm pressing play, we're getting a short circuit. Uh, it may be something to do with that switch again that switches the whole deck on. I'm going to look at that. But since I can get it both into the fault and non-fault condition, I'm going to look at the resistance across the supply rail in the fault and non-fault condition. It is playing now, but volume control is very crackly. This control here is tone. And it works the opposite way around to what you'd expect. So turning it up turns the treble down. Turning it down turns the treble up. And then you can switch your sound off with the treble control. Well, why not? It's Grundig. <laughs> Weird. Now it's distorted. Listen. It sounds to me like the original recording was set with an excessive record level. So I'm going to have to make my own recording to see if that is a real fault or not. Right, let's solve this problem now. Looking at the resistance across the supply rail. This is in a non-fault condition. I think we can safely say if I switch off the power supply and switch it back on again, hopefully it will run. Yes. While I'm here though, I'm going to look at this switch. This is what they call a frame switch, I think, here. I'm going to uh, squirt a bit of switch cleaner in there. That's the record play switch. And it just may do a little good to have some switch cleaner in there to make sure those contacts are nice and clean. Let's just do that briefly. OK. If you're old enough, you'll remember 40565 line TV sets in the UK, which switched between VHF transmissions on 405 lines and UHF on 65, and they used open frame switches, which are prone to getting dirty. They didn't even have this metalwork on them usually. Oh, did you hear that? What's going on? Ah, listen. No, it's not flexing the board. What's going on? It's as I assemble this board back into the deck, we get an intermittent short circuit. This would be fascinating when I find out what this cause is. Have we uh, accidentally cleared the fault without really knowing why? It does look that way, doesn't it? Okay, well...
let's hook up the power supply again and uh, see if it's now working reliably. Power it up. No overload, press play. Well, certainly working. Right, I'll power that down. I'll put some switch cleaner in the volume control and tone control. Okay, with some switch cleaner in there. I'll also uh, refit this meter. Okay, power it up. Now it's not working. <laughs> Battery level's okay. Oh, we've got this stupid switch. No, not that stupid switch. The motor's not running. But it's not overloading. Hmm, the motor was stalled out for some reason. That's working. Oh, another my key tops has fallen off. So I'll glue that back on and then we'll have to do a test recording. Okay, I've glued that key top back on. Let's just power it all up again and confirm it works. No, we have a stalled motor again. Why is the motor stalling? Which is uh, rewind. That's working. First time I've really tested that. And fast forward. All working very well. And there's pause. That's nice. So the main thing I need to do, well what happens if you press fast forward and it's playing? Huh, it jumps out, but it doesn't latch in fast forward and rewind, it's just the way it was designed. Probably because there's no auto stop mechanism at all. So how am I going to test this? Uh, I really need, I'll find a clean piece of tape because I don't want to record over this original recording. I mean, it's very old. It'd be a shame to erase it now. Uh, so I'll try to find a quiet piece of tape at the end of side two. Maybe there'll be some. And then I'll have to try to fathom out these connectors to see uh, if I can inject a, a low level audio. I don't have a signal generator to hand at the moment. I'm going to have to sort something out. Going towards the end of this tape. Any blank tape? Oh, good. Perfect. Do you have a tape counter? No. That's a nuisance. Go a little bit further. So we've got all this blank tape at the end to play with. 
so we have to be able to make a recording and I'm fairly sure there's no microphone on this thing so I'll have to rig it up there's a volume on here so it obviously detects audio recording so what I'll do is I'll put it into record pause which I think would be pause down and record and start I imagine and it'll sit there waiting for me to release pause right all we need to do is hook up some audio and we should be able to see the VU meter moving um, I'll switch off the power supply and um, I'll come back to you in a moment when I've hooked some kind of audio signal to that okay I have a one kilohertz tone playing out of this phone uh, which conveniently enough, enough has a three and a half mil uh, jack socket and I'm gonna have to find the input to this but of course it's labeled microphone so I may have to do some serious uh, attenuating but let's just see what happens initially okay hopefully that's rooted through to there um, do you know I might even fire up my oscilloscope at this point and just confirm I have that okay I've confirmed I've got one kilohertz tone from the oscilloscope I'll just turn that noisy thing off so now let's see if I can hook that to uh, one of the inputs and get it to read on this uh, meter so I put the machine into record pause right, I'm working my way through the inputs or oh, wherever they are oh look got it first time way too much record level of course we'll back off the volume level Oh look, that actually works. That looks okay. We're in about the middle of that meter. So I'm going to release pause and see if we get a recording. It's wobbling about a bit, but we should be recording one kilohertz tone. The volume level was right. Now the meters, the machine seems to have stalled again. Let's give the motor a bit of a kick. Now that's running. We've stopped for some other reason. The motor is running, but the tape is stopped. Ah, uh, nothing's ever easy. The belt appears to have fallen off or snapped. There we are, that's why we've stopped. So uh, I now need to change the drive belt. Here's the drive belt. It's intact and it seems to be in fairly good condition, but it fell off. Hmm. It takes a tortuous route through this deck, and it's completely non obvious how to refit it. What a dreadful, dreadful route for a drive belt to take. What were they thinking of? Okay, I've put the drive belt back on. Um, let's see if I can. Uh, get the machine to, to run, I will obviously have to buy a new drive belt. Rewind, oh good, that's working. Let's play. Oh hang on, we have a problem. What happened then, there was tape spooling out, this is not good. Oh dear. Everything's going wrong. When I hit rewind, that spool's going the wrong way. I've got the drive belt back the wrong way round on the motor. It's actually possible on this motor to put the drive belt on back to front. Belt's fallen off again. It's not going without a fight. So I've taken the belt completely out of the machine. Let's see if I've got a spare. It's quite a long belt. I suspect I won't have one of that size. I bought some um, belts from a Chinese seller on eBay a while ago. And they are pretty much useless. They are such low quality that I don't think I can ever imagine a condition in which I'd ever be able to use one of those. So uh, 
why they don't make actually decent usable quality belts, I don't know. There's no point just pretending you're making a drive belt and then produce something that's unusable. This is looking more promising. Just a little bit tighter. I like that. And that was from uh, another eBay seller, but not a Chinese one. He sells mixed drive belts. Yes, the new one's just a little bit more taut. They're about the same size. It's not massively so, it's just maybe 10%. Just what we want. Let's try and hook it around this horrible belt path this machine has. Last time I took this, wheel, this idler wheel off and I may have to do it again. Yes, it's going to have to come off again. It's got a rather unpleasant circuit to deal with. Wash it off and idle the wheel off. Right. This gives much better access to this area because the belt goes through there twice. It's a very strange tape path indeed. Used to seeing this sort of arrangement where you have a twin capstan deck, but this is a single capstan, so why is it so complicated? Connect up the power supply. No rewind, why not? Fast forward we have, rewind we don't. Play we have. So I'll need to fix that. Okay, lack of rewind is due to a circuit being on too tight. So, back to where we were, side two. Power up, rewind, and after a little bit more perseverance, I've got it hooked up, and I think we have good tone, and then good. Good, it works. I'll reassemble all that. After a number of hours working on this um, strange cassette recorder, I have solved all the problems. Well, pretty much. I understand all the problems and I've got it working. So uh, let's uh, talk you through some of the things I've done and uh, explain an interesting feature of this thing. Let me show you in a little more detail. Right, firstly, one of the problems I was having was that it was shorting out when I was pressing play. And that actually was my fault, not the machine's fault. It was due to the way I was connecting up the power source at the back here on these connectors. Oops. These spring connectors at the back. So using these crop clips has proven to be a solution to that. So that was a, a silly. Now uh, the original fault that the previous owner complained of on this thing was intermittent or no sound and I found it was intermittent sound that the sound would just disappear and you just get a little bit of hiss or something but no actual sound and there was a good reason for that and I'll provide you a better photo in a moment but the PCB here where it connects uh, it sort of slots into the chassis had a hairline crack in the PCB and that was uh, one of the uh, lines that goes to the final stage of the amplifier. So that's why intermittently we get no sound. So I patched that with a wire and that solved that problem. On a separate occasion I lost sound again and this was uh, a different part of the circuit where the voltages were all wrong due to the uh, output transformer, the audio output transformer um, having gone open circuit on the primary um, and I uh, had to take it off the board which was extremely hard uh, and find that uh, one of the windings had separated from its uh, contact on the edge of the transformer 
it required my microscope for me to be able to see the extremely fine wire and resolder and repair that. I was very lucky to be able to repair that. Mechanically it's all working. Fast forward's a little bit slow, but <laughs> I'm not going to worry too much about that. Mechanically I've got it all working quite reliably now. Uh, and the wear and flutter is acceptable as well. I'm not running a wear and flutter test on it, but it's uh, within reasonable specifications. Now, um, I discovered that the sound was a little distorted, so let's play uh, a recording, um, which I made earlier, which is of the outro of my own channel. So let's listen to that. So it sounds fundamentally okay, but there's a certain distortion to it, to the bass really. Well, <laughs> I was starting to suspect the speaker. So um, I made a test recording on my digital audio recorder over here. Actually, the very same one that's being used at the moment to record my voice. Uh, I made a test recording on here by connecting to the speaker terminals. And let me play a little bit of that for you. It was uh, very bass heavy. So it doesn't sound very pleasant at all. What's going on is I'm fairly sure there's a huge bass boost in the amplifier circuitry. Now we could look at the diagrams. There is some mention here about response curves, but of course it's all written in some foreign language. But there's, um, I think it's in French this one, bits of it are in English, but there is mention of a, um, a response curve in the final, final right page. So I think what's going on there is they're giving it a huge, here we go, huge bass boost in playback. There we go, look, big bass boost. So that's an attempt to make it sound <laughs> better, which um, may be true to a point. So it might be sound nicer musically, but what's gone on is the very heavy bass over a period of years has damaged the speaker cone. So when I tried to pull back the audio from the speaker terminals, it sounded awful because it's so bass heavy. And the speaker though is designed to sound right and would sound right, it's damaged. Now I'm gonna have a little go at fixing that speaker later, but is not necessary from the point of view of making the thing work so that I can recover recordings from here. But clearly the speaker terminals are not practical. The uh, diagrams here do show you that there's uh, DIN sockets. I'll give you the wiring of the DIN sockets. And when I pulled them on the side here, when I pulled the audio out, uh, one of the five pin DIN sockets and connected that to my digital audio recorder, uh, this is what we got. Uh, within the uh, limitations of that being a mono recording of course on this thing and the fact that it's very old and the tape is very old I would say the results were pretty damn good from that I would certainly not complain that that is in proper working order so fundamentally we have this thing fixed now I'm quite pleased with that so let's see if there's anything I can do about the speaker they've gone a bit overboard and put um, blobs of red sealant on the, the uh, screws but we're going to take these all the nuts, we're going to take these off. Occasionally it's possible to free up a speaker jam like that. So uh, let's see if there's anything I can do with it. Okay. We've got the speaker out. It's held on by five and a half millimeter nuts, which is a little bit difficult. Usually when a speaker sounds like that, if you push the cone, you can feel it binding. But this one doesn't seem to. This is all proving a little inconclusive. I'm not sure if there's a fault or not here. It sounds a little rough, but it might just be that really the bass output from this music is beyond what the speaker can take. I don't, I'm not sure there's actually a fault there. I'm going to reassemble that, get all this rubbish out of here and call that fixed. I'm, I don't believe it's a fault. It's not worth fixing anyway. 
I'm just about to uh, start reassembling this, but before I do that, um, I wanted to mention that these are just some of the electrolytic capacitors I've replaced. I found quite a few of the capacitors in there were leaky. So that's not to say uh, effective series resistance, which is what this is really good at testing, but the uh, capacitance actually appears high rather than low, and it's because the capacitor takes too long to charge because it effectively has a resistor bypassing it. And I was concerned that that was going to uh, damage the performance of the amplifier. So wherever I found them, I replaced them, although I could have probably replaced every single capacitor to good effect. Uh, that would have taken too much time. Now, uh, something I do want to do, uh, this is the volume, sorry, this is the tone, and also it switches the amplifier off. If, for example, you're using the DIN sockets, but why that's on the tone control is anybody's guess. This is the volume control, uh, has the same legend. Oh, have I got that in the wrong place? The cover fell off this, so I need to put these back in the right place. I wonder if that's the volume. Let me have a look. I've put some glue in here, so I need to act fairly quickly before the glue sets. Would that be volume, do you think? And then this one would be the tone and off, because this ha has an, an arrow there. I think that might be the case. So let's fit the knob first, and then that's maximum somewhere there, and that would then be zero, or <laughs> treble cut actually, because it works back to front, because it's Grundig, and then that will be the audio amplifier off position. So that must sit there. Right. That makes sense. The two controls line up, and then that's got the off position. Oh, good. I like that. I haven't screwed all the cabinet work back on yet. I'll just power it up. Oh. You know, it's always out to get you. What's happened now? It's covered in mains hum. Where's that coming from? volume control doesn't the noise is after the volume control but before the tone control uh, it may just be a problem with the way I've got it wired up let's check it see what I can find out I'll put it in play pause. Ah, oops, that's part of the speaker bracket. I wonder if that's caused my problem. <laughs> that would be embarrassing. Let's just uh, see if that's uh, solved the problem. If it has, then this is part of the speaker bracket that I need to refit. Yes. Embarrassing. Let's fit that on the speaker. Well, that's all nicely reassembled. Um, I'm still somewhat mystified by this eject mechanism. It seems to consist of something like this. You uh, take the door off, really, 
and then you can go from if you're in start you can go to stop and press it again and it should eject but it doesn't fortunately it takes a few jabs but at least eventually it will so we'll settle for that not too big a problem now since the cabinet's fully reassembled including the battery hatch now I need to uh, solve one final problem which is how to connect this very obscure variant of a deconnector DIN connector which is the uh, power supply connector got the polarity information from the diagrams uh, but the I think let me see if I can find that in a moment but the uh, bigger problem is trying to find some sort of connector that will fit it there's an optional power pack unfortunately this one doesn't have it which will give you your 9 volt DC 500 milliamp output um, I don't want to hack up the battery box really so really I need to find a way to connect to this obscure connector so uh, let me see if I can work out what the uh, pinout is here we go pins 1 and 5 seem to be the power and it disconnects the battery aha so when you insert a plug it breaks the contact from the batteries well not a serious problem for me since I'll never have any batteries in there so all I need to do is find a way of connecting to pins 1 and 5 um, of this modified DIN connector and get the polarity correct uh, and then I can power it from an external power source let's uh, patch that up well I'm uh, quite happy as it's come out now so I've rigged up a uh, DC power cable uh, which will take a standard um, bell jack so that solves the uh, power supply problems uh, the supply requirement for this is 9 volts and I've got a regulated supply here with a 9 volt output but actually it was a bit generous it's approaching 10 volts and I know a lot of the capacitors in here are only rated to 10 volts and given that they're very old that's pushing it so I dropped this power supply down to a 7.5 volt output rating which gives around about 8.5 volts actually uh, which runs the unit fine so that's going to be my setting on that power supply uh, and that's with this um, conjured up it's a modified three pin DIN connector wide space type um, which I'm using now as the power connector so that's that's beautiful and then for the audio output a standard um, five pin DIN to phono and actually just this cable here gives me the line out uh, and I've done some uh, recordings on my digital audio recorder and I'd like to play a bit of that from the original tape that came with it and you know it's so good I found myself actually just listening to it and enjoying the recording so uh, it almost you can forget that you're playing this this elderly machine and just get lost in the actual recording it's really good I'd like some comments please on what age you think this recording is have a listen going up again. <laughs> Leslie Crowther which of the seven dwarfs would you play well I, I would for the same reason that Ted wouldn't have to learn his part I wouldn't have to learn my part because I'd play sleepy and if ever I forgot it I'd just go <laughs> Charles. General, I can't remember whether you chose a dwarf for us, did you? Well, I said that I would be sneezy and, and pronounce Miss Owen's name, if you remember, earlier on in this yes. question, before all this other drivel was spouted out. <laughs> <laughs> but I think... Spouted out. On second... Spouted out. On second <laughs> thoughts, though, I wouldn't mind being um, sleepy, as, of course, I always am on this programme and never say anything, as he never does. Well, I don't know. You, you keep can... You keep on saying that, and every week you come out with these brilliant shafts of wit. <laughs> Well, I hope you've enjoyed learning something about the insides of this fantastic uh, Grundig C100L uh, DC International format uh, cassette recorder. I think it's come out brilliantly in the end, and I can now support this format as one of the uh, audio transfers that I can do for people. Um, do please remember to like, share, and especially subscribe, and I'll do more content on audio and video technology in the future. Bye for now.